First of all, Paul, uh, on behalf of the Commerce Cycling Club, I would like to say thank you very much for agreeing to conduct this interview today. Um, no worries, Peter. You've read the introduction. Yeah. Um, we put down two descriptions of Paul Kimmich. Yeah. Um, which description is most accurate? Uh, well, I think I enjoy the flattering description better than the other one. Um, okay. <laughs> Which is more accurate? Well, again, <laughs> it's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of what uh, what you make of me. Uh, uh, look, I've no control over what people think of me. Yeah. Um, I try to be myself. I try to be true to myself. Some people uh, like that. Some people don't. And uh, you know, um, I, as I say, I have no control over that. Um, so you know, again. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I've no control over what's more accurate. Well, I don't know. I suppose, uh, you know, I suppose there's a bit of both of me, you know, a bit of both of those descriptions would be probably more accurate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. The overwhelming position on your stance from grassroots cycling is one of the utmost respect, and I think a significant number of cyclists would strongly agree with your position. That's certainly from you know, putting the feelers out amongst our club members, anyhow. Some would not. If we go back 20 years to when you wrote a rough ride, some people said you were a hard-working amateur, and when you became a pro that this stopped, or that you'd reached the limits of your talent as an amateur rider. Your results as a pro were less about doping and more about you. What is your response to that view? Well, um... I think I acknowledged in Rough Ride exactly, I think I exactly said more or less the same thing that, you know, I had pretty much reached my limits as, uh, as an amateur. I mean, I, think, I don't think I ever denied that. Mm-hmm. Um, I would challenge the view that I stopped working hard as a pro and that's why I didn't progress, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, my result, my result as a pro were less about doping than more about you. Well, I, I'd accept that if if you accept and those people accept that there was no doping in the sport. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're telling me there was no doping in the sport and I made all this up, I think that's a valid point. Yeah. I think the 22 years have, since I've shown that there was doping in the sport, I played a huge part. Now, was that a factor in in uh, in my career? Yes, I believe it was. I've never ever pretended for one second I was going to win a Tour de France, but I do mm-hmm. think, uh, had I doped uh, and accepted the practices of the menu, that I would have had a much more successful career. And uh, that I mean absolutely no doubt. And I think when, you know, having made the choice that I did not to dope, then it certainly made, lessened mm-hmm. uh, my career as a cyclist and reduced my ability to get the best from myself, you know. Um, is it logical that you can go from, you know, competing at the amateur world championship to Fondry yes, beating these Germans as they did and then some professional and suddenly, you know, you're just an all star ran, you know. I think okay. I, I think I was better than that. Do you I think? think I think I was better than uh I think I was better than my results, mm-hmm. you know. Uh but as I said, I was never pretended I would ever have won a tour of France, never pretended I was equal to Kelly or Roach. Mm-hmm. Um but again, you know, uh Less about doping and more about you. No, that that I must would definitely not agree. Okay. Do you think that the when you became aware of doping or the extent of doping in the peloton, that um, it affected you more physically or disadvantaged you more physically or psychologically? Well, both. Mm-hmm. Both. And one is you know psychological disadvantage is massive. You know, mm-hmm. I mean the example I would always use is um, in my first year. Uh, as a pro, we went up to Brittany to Plumelec and uh, I finished eighth. It was a week, a week after the Dauphiné, I drove there to Terry Clevirola and André Chapuis. Mm-hmm. And we finished eighth, I finished eighth, I think, in, in Plumelec, on the Grand Prix of Plumelec, which was on a hard circuit, a tough mm-hmm. race, a bloody hard circuit up that hill. Mm-hmm. Two of us finished there a couple of times. And uh, I was riding really well, and eighth was a bloody fine performance. Um, and I only realised uh, a few weeks later that pretty much everybody had been doped in that race. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't realise at the time. Um, but knowing that they had been doped uh, definitely made it harder to, to do what I did. You know, when I went out next time and I could see it and witness it firsthand, 
psychologically, now I was shot then, and when I actually experienced the power of the drugs that were being used, the amphetamines, when I mm-hmm. tried it myself and I understood and experienced how powerful they were, and then when I stopped using amphetamines, I mean, use them on three occasions, when I stopped then, mm-hmm. uh, it psychologically it just made it, I won't say impossible, but very, very difficult. Okay. To to race as I had once raced in uh, in in Plumerick when I was oblivious to it. Um, so you know, one psychological yes, and physical they're both linked. Mm-hmm. You know, there's depth, there's a connection, there's an absolute connection between one and the other. And um, you know, la tête la tête et les jambes. The, you know, how we describe cycling, what it's all about. It's all about la tête et les jambes. So there you go. The head and the legs. Yeah, so it was in my head, and therefore mm-hmm. it was also in my legs. Okay, so you cycled from when you were a teenager. Yeah. And um, when did you first become aware there was drugs and cycling? Well, first become aware. I mean, I was. Um, I'm trying to think what age I was when Che Elliott died. Mm-hmm. Um, that would have been after Tom Simpson. I think everybody was kind of aware mm-hmm. of Tom Simpson. Um, everybody had been was aware of what Shay had written some stuff. I wasn't aware of that mm-hmm. aware of that until actually much later than Ruff Lloyd. I hadn't actually wasn't aware uh, Shay had ever confessed to using any drugs until well, well after Ruff Lloyd. It would mm-hmm. have made it would have made Ruff Lloyd much easier for me had I been aware that Shay had written these confessions a series of newspaper articles. But personally there was the the watershed moment obviously where Simpson's death mm-hmm. And then before my time, there would have been plenty of play of the tour, about 78, mm-hmm. I think. That would have been a big moment. I'm trying to think, was there any big ones then just after that? Uh, so, yeah, definitely a sense that there was doping in the sport. And but in your own personal experience? Um, in my own personal experience, it mm-hmm. was when I saw Pro in uh, in 86. Yeah, immediately. I, I, in pretty much within two months, yeah. Okay. At, at, a, at the Grand Prix show day when uh, I saw, I was shown how to uh, take amphetamines, how were amphetamines were used for races like that. Mm-hmm. So is it fair to say that you went in a little bit naive? Or? Uh, yeah, a little bit naive. Naive yeah. in the sense that, you know, I was convinced that while... I had an awareness there were there were drugs in the sport. Mm-hmm. I was pretty convinced they weren't going to affect me, um, and I realised pretty soon that they were going to affect me. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, so that was the, that was the naivety, I suppose, thinking that uh, you know I, it was something that I was going to be able to uh, get through my my career without without it affecting me. Yeah, that was the naivety. Okay. Um, again, <coughs> back to a rough ride, Paul. Many 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 members of our club feel that you had said something really, really important when you wrote a rough ride, Um, but then you disappeared, that you turned your back on cycling. Many cyclists felt let down by this, and I would say at the time I was probably one of them as a 16-year-old. What was going on for you at this time? Well, it's an interesting view. I mean, I kind of felt that cycling was turned its back on me, you know, I mean... uh I set out to do something that was good for the sport, you know, expose mm-hmm. this problem, let the, you know, get the UCI. Mm-hmm. I wasn't pointing the finger at anybody except the UCI. Mm-hmm. There's no controls on these races. The abuse is rampant. You need to address this. You need to get the controls. You put the control controls in. The guys don't take the stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, so that that was what I was trying to do. <coughs> you know, uh, when I when I left the sport, um, I mean, people always question my motives. But I'm bitter. Mm. Uh, he didn't have a great career. He's bitter because he didn't have a great career. This is why he's doing this book. Look, I had no bitterness at all about the sport. Mm. I had achieved pretty much everything I set out to achieve as a kid. Ridden the Tour of France, the World Championships, had great moments. Uh, wasn't as successful as I hoped it'd be, but look, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I accepted that. Mm-hmm. Uh, had a chance to go into a new career. I was offered a chance to start a new career as a journalist. Took that chance. Went from being Pay them I was at seven grand a year to over twenty grand a year. So I'm getting three times more as a journalist than I am as a cyclist. And people are saying, Well, he's bitter. Well what the fuck had I got to be bitter about? I've tripled my wages, I'm in a brilliant new career, you know, life is good for me. And mm-hmm. I'm I'm being accused of being bitter. That never made any sense to me at all. Uh so my only motive I had for writing the book was actually trying to do some good for the sport. 
And then when I did it, I got this massive slap in the in the jaw because people wouldn't accept it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, I felt the sport torn on me. Not that I, I didn't have a torn on the sport, but the sport torn on me. And yes, definitely for... Mm-hmm. For eight years, the experience of that and the reaction to Rough Ride definitely poisoned my view of the sport. Mm-hmm. Definitely, you know, having yeah. set out, yeah. having set out to do something good for the sport, uh, to be kicked in the nuts in the way that I was definitely poisoned mm-hmm. my view uh, and my love for the sport until mm-hmm. I'd say 1998 when mm-hmm. Fatina happened and suddenly all of the people that were had questioned me were acknowledging that I'd actually told the truth and that I'd actually set out to do. Something that was important and good for the sport. And you had to wait that long before it I happened? I had to wait eight years, really, yeah. Uh, eight years okay. before uh, before it happened. Okay. Uh, and it was difficult, you know. I went back to the tour in 90. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Cherry Clever, oh, that'll be good to him, you know, spat me off my face. Someone who I regarded as, you know, a really, really close friend. Mm-hmm. Someone I really had great respect and time for. Uh, and he'd never read the book, or he'd read Stephen Roach's account of it mm-hmm. in the keep. But Stephen Roach saying that, you know, this fellow has betrayed everybody. So what else was he to think? Um, so that was not a pleasant experience. It was not a, not pleasant being around the peloton and everyone looking at you with daggers in their eyes, you know, thinking you were absolutely after <coughs> knifing them in the back. That was not fun at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that was... Uh, they were they were a difficult few years, very difficult few years. It seems like you understand um, why they thought in the way they did. Now, does that make it easier for you to? Do you feel less emotional about it now, or? Well, I understand why they did. They, well, I understood. I understood why Cabby Roller felt mm. the way he he felt. Mm-hmm. Um, because look, if he was reading this in the keep and he hadn't access mm. to what I'd actually read. Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, didn't read what I'd actually written rather. Yeah. What else was he, was he to think? Um, you, know, you know, the Irish public were in a different position because mm-hmm. they actually could read it. Yeah. And I think anybody uh, who was fair and objective about it would have said, well, look, you know, either these points are valid or they're not. Mm-hmm. Either this is going on or it's not. Um, okay. So, you know, well, I would understand why... Jerry felt that way, you know, mm-hmm. you know other, other people I'd be less, uh, less uh, gentle with, really, yeah. Okay, thank you. There are examples <coughs> of those who tried in their own way to change cycling from the inside out and not from the outside in by competing clean. David Miller is one example, Jonathan Vouter is possibly another, Christoph Bassans tried for a time, her own Kieran Power made a living as a clean rider. Looking back, would you have done anything differently? Well, I mean, Bassan never doped. He's the only mm. one of that group. Well, I don't know about Kieran Power. Uh, you tell me he's a clean rider, I accept that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd ask you a question, Peter. I'd yeah. ask you, is it? You think about all of the Irish professionals. Do you actually, would you believe that Paul Kimmages and Shay Elliott are the only two who ever took drugs? Is that plausible? That Paul Kimmy okay. and Australia are the only two of that group who ever took drugs and all the pros we've had. Some people would say, yeah, of course it is. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I haven't spoken ever. I met mm-hmm. Kieran, I think, once or twice maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd like to speak to him about his experiences. I think that we've had uh, some stuff in the Times this week about mm-hmm. the amount of doping that was going on in that team. I'm mm-hmm. sure he'd be very interested on that subject. Look, I'm not yeah. passing any expressions on Kieran yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, but I think it would be interesting to speak to him. Um, um, about his experiences you know, mm-hmm. about what he saw uh, but you know again he hasn't spoken about it what about the idea that some people cha- tried to change cycling from the inside out and that whereas people might say that you tried to change it from the outside in and so what does that mean you have to explain that because I don't quite well I suppose uh, if, you look at, if you look at change from the inside out da- David Miller was uh, was contrite he was caught doping he went back and joined the peloton and tried to set an example for for younger riders to say that he could ride clean. Would would the would that opportunity have not been available to you if if you do you ever look back and say that that would have been a possibility? Well, I tell you, there, I was, mean, abs- there was absolutely no possibility at all. 
Okay. Well, after a rough no, no, ride. No, no, no. Yeah. Let me let me finish. There was no possibility at all yeah. that I was ever going to write rough ride and say it remain in the peloton. I mean, that was absolutely that's an absolute nonsense to suggest that you could have yeah. produced that book and then go back, you know, a week later yeah. and, and compete with you. That that just wouldn't happen. I mean, you would immediately mm-hmm. give you thrown out of the spot. There would have been no place for you at all. Uh, obviously, a lot has happened since Rough Ride, and a lot mm-hmm. has happened, and what has happened has enabled David Miller to uh, to compete again, mm-hmm. having having uh, have, having written his book. So you know, you're not comparing, you're not comparing like like I didn't ever yeah. have. There was never, no, there was no possibility that I could have ever changed it from the inside out. I mean, mm-hmm. if you look back, and I've got the interviews there. Mm-hmm. On an interview I did a year before Rough Ride came out with Lakeith during the tour, and mm-hmm. I mentioned in their interview what my intentions are. I said, look, there's a lot of problems in this sport. I intend to write about them. You know, I flagged it. Mm-hmm. It was right there for everybody to see. That my intentions were that, you know, I was going to write about this, and that something needs to be done. And I remember uh, a couple of guys coming up to me after and saying, yeah, well done. That was good. Good of you tell that, you know. So when you gave me the opportunity to do something about it before going public. Yeah, well, I, I, as I said, in, in the 89 tour, mm-hmm. uh, my last tour, I was interviewed by, by Philip Brunel and McKeith, mm-hmm. and I told him what my intentions were. You know, that yeah, there are problems, yeah. they needed to be addressed, I was going to do something about mm-hmm. it. Um, but look, that would never have happened. I, I, I would never yeah. have had, have been able to write Rough Ride and then go back racing a week later or a year later. No way, that wouldn't have worked. So is it safe to say that you wouldn't have done anything differently? I have... Absolutely, but not have done anything differently. No, okay. not a bit of it. No, I wouldn't change any of it. No, it wouldn't take. Wouldn't change the fact that I wrote Rough Ride. Wouldn't change the fact that I used amphetamines three times. Wouldn't change any of it. It has mm-hmm. all helped to shape me for better or worse into what I am now. And you know, I had some fantastic experiences. You know, Jesus. Uh, you know, I've got great memories of my time mm-hmm. as a bike rider. Uh, and you know some of them are harder than others, but you know it's all helped to make me what I am today. You know, and um, I wouldn't change any of it at all. Is there any one particular thing? I mean, you spoke about Festina in 1998. Yeah. Is there any one particular event that has helped to rekindle your interest it's in pro cycling? Because it, it, it seems from reading transcripts of interviews in the past that that, interview, that, that interest waned a little bit. Is there any one key moment that, that re- reignited your interest? Well, see, everything was big coloured. You mm. know, everything was coloured by the reaction to Rough Ride in terms of my uh, my writing on the sport. Everything was coloured by that um, mm-hmm. and what happened after that. Mm-hmm. Um. I enjoyed the greatly the 2008 tour when I went back and spent the tour with Vardas and with the Garmin team mm-hmm. Miller on the Vell tour. Terrific human beings, mm-hmm. great people to be around. Um, really enjoyed that experience, and I enjoyed that experience very simply because it was the first time since I'd left the sport that I'd been welcome back. Yeah, every time okay. I'd gone back up until then, I was viewed. To a John this guy, with a John this guy. Uh, and it was the first time I was welcome back, and you know, that definitely made it a much more enjoyable experience and enabled mm-hmm. me to um, uh, to enjoy the race more, yeah. definitely. And you know, I, I went back, I enjoyed the uh, 2010 or the one Evans one. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a terrific race. Um, I greatly enjoyed the women's road race at the Olympics this year. I thought that was a fantastic race. Mm-hmm. Absolutely fantastic race. I enjoyed, perversely, the men's race for a different reason. I just thought the Brits, you know, took on a lot, but did put up a really great ride and almost pulled her off, mm-hmm. which would have been amazing. So, yeah, there are aspects of it. You know, I can still watch a race and enjoy it. Definitely, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't always well, believe it. I mean, there's been a lot of times when I've looked at it and said, this is a fucking joke. I mean, I didn't, I watched the Armstrong years and I thought, it was a complete fucking joke. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at, and this is the thing where I would ask you to challenge Kelly and Roberta Thomas commentators. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're looking at what these guys are fucking doing, and they've fucking done it. They've run up the fucking outdoors 
They know what fucking hardware is, and you see these fucking Robocops, you know, who are almost freewheeling, not out of breath, look like it's, you know, uh, this is taking nothing out of them, and, mm. and they're, you know, waxing fucking lyrical about it, like, this is fantastic and great, and they don't have any sense, or won't express, not that they don't have it, but mm. they won't ex- ex- express any uh, questions about it. Or the slightest form of cynicism or, or mm-hmm. uh, criticism about it, you know. So, uh, so it suggests lots of the, if you, particularly if you look at Armstrong, lots of the cycling media were making money. Well, they made serious from, money. From yeah. our, they, made, at, they made serious money out of it, yeah. They I made just, serious money out of it. I think about uh, cycle sport that always took a traditionally anti-doping stance, yeah. but... See, Ab- they made serious money over, and that's fine. Yeah. But what I'm saying to them is, don't you tell me you look you love cycling. Yeah. Don't tell me you love cycling. I, I can understand that you want to make money. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me in the next breath that you love cycling because you don't. Mm-hmm. If you love cycling, you wouldn't have, you know, padded your wallet like the way you did. Yeah. And uh, and been a part of this charade. Okay. Why La- why did Lance Armstrong receive so much of your attention? Why not Indran, Merckx, or Ulrich? What's what's ha- what's made what chain of events yeah, has made that happen? That's a good question. That's a fair question. Mm. Uh, right, or, uh, let's go in order. Merckx before my time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the question is, you know, did he dope? Yeah, I'd say without question. I think it's you don't get conjecture. The fact that he dope, mm-hmm. he's he had definitely a positive there. Mm-hmm. Ulrich, uh, for me, the most talented of that era of his era. Always felt he had five five tours in him. Again, uh, I would have questioned uh, his performances. Mm-hmm. I think that was it. Well, they're even covering it then. Uh, Ulrich was 97. Was well, I on the tour that year? I didn't cover it for a long time. Obviously, before Festina. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that kind of gap between. Uh, Rough Rider to Stina. I didn't go back that often and didn't cover it that closely. So that took kind of Ulrich and Reese and these people off my radar uh, in sense I wasn't writing about it. Uh, Injuran, I was admirer of Injuran but I had no mm-hmm. idea about Epo. Uh, absolutely no idea about Epo until obviously, obviously later. Um, and I remember making that argument to David, to David Walsh one night mm-hmm. in uh, in St Andrews. We were sharing a room together. At the British Open in 2005. I said, "Look, you know, because at that stage uh, he'd been in the war a big time with uh, with Armstrong, and it was hurting. I know it was hurting his family." Mm-hmm. I said, "Look, you gotta let this go. This this is starting to hurt you now. It's hurting your career. It's hurting your family." And I remember saying to me, "You know what makes?" Lance any fucking different than, than Injuran because um, I didn't believe he was but they said well he is mm-hmm. fucking different and he was different in that mm-hmm. he had this vast uh, cancer shield he, he protected himself with his cancer shield mm-hmm. he was more cynical he had a more dominant position in the sport mm-hmm. um, so in that way he was different um, and funnily enough after advising David to step away from it, I actually stepped, went back to it. You know, after 2006, 2007, he stepped away, and I actually went in there. I mm-hmm. took the bottom off, bottom off, and I went, uh, went out for Armstrong then, you know. Um, but it's a fair question. Mm. It's a fair question. It sounds like you're saying that the hypocrisy around Armstrong was, was much bigger than the hypocrisy around some of the other writers. Because of the cancer shield, because of the entourage. Well... Is that, is that what you're saying? I think uh, 1998 was, should have been the line of the sand. Yeah. You know, and that would be Injuran. I'd come before that. In 1998, there was no one could deny uh, the role that doping and drugs were mm-hmm. playing in the sport. Mm-hmm. Up until then, you could have said, yeah, I didn't think it was that bad. And I probably would have said, mm-hmm. no, I didn't think it was that bad. I mean, mm-hmm. because, you know, after ninety. Uh, Four ninety five, ninety six. Mm-hmm. When I was away from it, I was looking at it, looking on it as a distant observer. I had no idea how bad it was. It was not absolutely mm-hmm. no idea. I mean, it, it was sure was shocking, and I, but I was again. 
uh, I was very much uh, look on the outside looking in at that stage and wasn't uh, playing an active role as a journalist. Uh, but after 1998, I think um, that was a chance for the sport to move on. So that's what makes that's what made Lance different. At the moment when the sport had a real chance mm-hmm. of moving on, who was the first champion of the new era? Lance. And what did he do? We just dragged everybody straight back into it again. And, okay. uh, and had a really bad influence on the sport. So that, that's what I would argue makes them different. Okay. There were some reports at that time. That's that Ulrich, the only difference, really. Yeah. That Ulrich and, uh, who was this other rival at the time? Lance Ulrich. That they, were Ulrich prepared, to they were prepared to, to away. Tra- draw a line yeah. on the rest. Yeah, I read that. Pevenich said that about yeah. actually. Uh, about Ulrich. Then. Rudy Pevenich said yeah. that, yeah. That they were going to pull away from the body. They were drawn back into it, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Where did you get the courage to take on Lance Armstrong? I mean, um, three years ago, Tour of California, we hear an Irish accent in the background. Paul Kimmage takes on uh, the cancer Jesus, Lance Armstrong. Yeah, I never saw it as... uh, I saw it as my job. I saw it as my job to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I didn't really see it as a courageous thing to do. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had a much bigger, much bigger deal for me personally. What was three years before that was in Shell de Bruyne, mm-hmm. and that was much more difficult to stand up in your own country mm-hmm. against uh, the first ever woman to win an Olympic medal. To take a stand like I did then, like we did then, mm-hmm. at that time was much, much more difficult than mm-hmm. standing up to uh, to Lance. Um, so that steeled me, if you want, mm-hmm. for what came later. Uh, the stance that I took against uh, the broom, uh, and that enabled me then to, you know, I, I looked upon it as just doing my job, so I, I didn't see it as, and, and I'm always, I find it amusing that so much is made of that. I mean, you look mm-hmm. at it, you pair it back, and what is it? It's, you know, a journalist asking a perfectly valid question at a press conference, and suddenly it's fucking, it's all over the internet, mm-hmm. and people are going crazy about it, and you think, well, what does that say about A? Well, what do we say about journalism in our profession that, you know, <laughs> someone has a question of Lance Armstrong and suddenly it's, you know, headline news. So I think it was a bad reflection on, on, on journalism. Uh, but I didn't see it as a, uh, as being courageous. I just thought, look, that's what, that's our job. We're not paid to be popular. I mean, journalists keep forgetting this. We're mm-hmm. not, you know, certainly sporty. Journalists keep forgetting this. You know, we're not actually paid to be popular. You know, you're supposed mm-hmm. to do this. This is, what you're, this is what you're supposed to do for your job. And if journalists had done their jobs, uh, there would have been much less stopping in the spot. Right back to Marx in this time. And journalists are complicit mm-hmm. in this problem. It's not just the writers of the UCI. Journalists have also played a role in making it as bad as it was. So you're talking about a higher standard of journalism yeah, than, than, the, than, the, yeah. than the average. But you spoke about being nervous um, when when the spat was in full yeah. flight. Yeah, well, I was. It was uh, unnerving. Uh, you know, to be sitting there in that arena, theatre as it was, you know, and have this, you know, iconic sportsman mm. ranting and raving at you and not having the right mm-hmm. to reply. Uh, that was uncomfortable, no question about that. I mean, that's I had plenty to say to them, and it was just frustrating for me that I had to sit there and take it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was rattled by the experience, definitely. Definitely rattled by it. Um, but more than anything, it was frustrating that I didn't have, a, have the right to play. Because I went back the next day, uh, and what was, well, sorry, what was more frustrating was mm-hmm. that I tried to write a piece about it for the, mm-hmm. the Times that week, and they wouldn't run it. Mm-hmm. Um, because I went back... On the, at the prologue and I stood mm-hmm. on, the, on the start line where mm-hmm. Armstrong was and he was literally two feet away from me I was there standing right in front of him just wanted to show him look gee Brandon right me I'm not you know not going to affect me at all you know come again if you've got more to say I'm here I'll hear it again I'll talk back to you this time so you know it wasn't going to affect me uh, I wasn't going to let it affect me at all but it was yeah. frustrating that I couldn't uh, write about it and it was frustrating that I couldn't write about it, not just uh, in 09 at the Tour mm-hmm. of California, but also in 09 at the Tour, and also in uh, 2010 at the Tour. Uh, I was, I was you know, banned, forbidden by my newspaper drive against Lance Armstrong. 
which I think ultimately played a big part in their mm-hmm. decision to let me go. Okay. Paul, moving on from that, um, can you tell me about how your relationship with Pat McQuaid, the current president of the UCI, has developed over the years? I don't know if you're aware of the uh, the photograph of yourself and Pat at the uh, World Championships, I believe. Yeah, Arm at, the Arm, at the 85 World Championships. He yeah. was your team manager. Yeah. Um, I know your relationships change, but can you talk a little bit about that? Well, obviously the families go back a long way. You know, you know, the Quays are a big cycling family in Dublin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim, Pat's dad, raced with my dad, Christy. Yeah. Uh, I knew Jim, I know Jim, Jim well, liked Jim a lot. My dad liked Jim a lot. Uh, obviously, I raced with young Jim McQuaid. Mm-hmm. I raced with Pat, Kieran, and Oliver. I raced with a lot of them. Uh, and we got on pretty good during that time. Um, and we got on well then when Pat became a team manager. He managed me when I went to the milk race in mm-hmm. 83 and I almost won there. Yeah. He managed me in 84 in Los Angeles, the Olympic Games, and he managed me in 85 mm-hmm. at the World Road Race, Amateur Road Race, when I finished sixth. So we had a pretty decent relationship. Uh, I wouldn't say there wasn't difficulties in it, you know. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I didn't take kindly at times to be asked to hand back my skin to it after the time trial, team time trial at the Olympic Games, I thought it was a bit of, a bit much to have to hand back your skin to after you've ridden the Olympic Games for your country. So stuff like that would have been a bit of a source of irritation between us, but you know, they were only small things. So up until, I suppose, Rough Rider, you would have had a pretty decent relationship. After Rough Rider, obviously, mm-hmm. it was very different. And that, again, was a, was a, a big moment because Pat was one of the people who was uh, standing there firing the bullets at me when Rough Rider was published. And mm-hmm. that, that changed everything. That uh, skewered the relationship. For good, really, I suppose, from, from the time Rough Rider was uh, published. I mean, when the tour came here in '98, mm-hmm. before Christina broke, uh, there was uh, a couple of Dutch journalists came over and they were looking, asking about Kimmich, where's Kimmich, where can we get hold of him? And McQuaid was telling them, and I was told this by one of them, mm-hmm. one of the journalists said, Look, McQuaid told them, uh, You don't want to talk to Kimmich, he's back for something. So then people find it curious, you know, mm-hmm. that I. Uh, I start splitting my sides laughing when, I'm t- when I hear McQuay talking about you know all the good he's going to do and how he's going to clean the sport up when I compare that to the stance he'd taken you know, a few years earlier it just makes me okay. laughable really how much of it is personal now? how much of it is personal? well mm. ask, ask him I mean okay. uh, he initiated he initiated the, uh, the lawsuit against me mm-hmm. he had the choice of if he wanted it was, it was about justice for him. Mm-hmm. It was about justice for his name. Uh, he could have brought the Sunday Times to court, or he mm-hmm. could have brought the keep to court, and he could have got justice. But it wasn't about that. Mm-hmm. It was, he singled me out. He used the UCI's money to do it. Uh, so I'll ask him why, why is it so personal. Okay. You know. Maybe maybe he'll he made it. He made it personal when he did that. He made it personal. Okay. Maybe he'll give uh, Conor Sagan Club the opportunity to do that at some stage. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he will. <laughs> I'm sure he will. Um, during his tenure as head of the UCI, do you think he has done anything well? Uh, do I think he's done anything well? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer because obviously I view him with given the absolute contempt. Yes that I hold him in, it's difficult for me to give him any credit. Uh, look, he came into the sport in 05 or 06, he became president. Um, obviously, Floyd went positive in 06, mm-hmm. was busted after three days, and you would have thought, yeah, great, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, at least finally they're going to, uh, they're going to start applying the rules fairly to everybody now. But when I see when I see how he bent over backwards to to protect Armstrong, mm-hmm. it's hard for me to have any respect at all for him. When I see the extent to which he tried to uh, protect Armstrong, you know, uh, rolling out the red car- carpet for him, riding in the Tour of Ireland, uh, his brother is tweeting about Armstrong, what a great fellow he is. Uh, private breakfast between McQuaid and Armstrong in Paris. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that's. Whatever good he did, 
and it was minute, uh, is completely washed away by the bad he's done in the way he uh, protected Armstrong. And, you know, you would have to ask yourself a question. Mm-hmm. If he really had the sports interest at heart, you know, the, one of the first whistleblowers in the Armstrong case was Emma Riley, whose brother Nobby raced with McQuaid's club in Dublin. Mm-hmm. Pat McQuaid never spoke to her once. Never spoke to her once. So if he really had a good, good in the sport at heart, would he have done that? No, I don't think so. So they turned a blind eye to totally. Joe Tech. Absolutely. Yeah. They totally turned a blind eye to Lance Armstrong, yeah. And you compare, you compare, and you know, he said, ah, that was years ago and things are much better now. Well, look, uh, Lam, uh, Floyd was, they busted Floyd after three days. Mm-hmm. They took six weeks to go after Contador. They sat in Contador's case for six weeks. And it was only when German TV, ARD, found out about it that they actually announced it. Six weeks they sat in it. So that tells me they would have done it again. Mm-hmm. That tells me they would have protected Contador in the way they protected Armstrong. Do you think they hide behind uh, procedures and rules? No, they don't hide behind rules because if they hide, if they if they if they, they don't apply the rules, mm. they don't hide behind them. They just don't apply mm. them. It's a difference. Anne Gripper said when she was in charge of the blood passport scheme, she felt McQuaid was sincere in in respect of its introduction and its application. Yeah, I think in respect of its introduction, possibly not in respect mm. of its application. Mm. She's, not, she's also on the record saying she was very, very uncomfortable with the fact that they allowed Armstrong to go in and compete in Australia before I'd been mm-hmm. six months back in the testing programme. She, she did not agree with that at all. Yeah. So he may have been, she may have been uh, um, crediting for the introduction of it, but certainly the application mm-hmm. of it has left a lot to be desired. It's an a la carte system. I mean, he said, you see, has great rules, mm-hmm. great rules, about many other sports. The problem is mm-hmm. they don't apply them. They employ them, it's, you know, it's an allocated system of justice. Oh, we, we do him, but no, mm-hmm. he's too good. No, we, yeah, no, we, we protect him. Oh, yeah, we have him, but we won't have him. Now, look, you ain't going to be, you're not able to run a sport like that. Unless you put your mm-hmm. fairly everybody, then, you know, the guys are going to look at this, as Floyd did, and they're going to say, this system is fucked. The only way I've got to, I could compete here, the only way I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to not be cheated is to cheat. But can you give me an example of when you think the rules were applied inconsistently? Inconsistently? Yeah. Since forever. But what specific case? Well, look at Palantia in 78. In, 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 ugly, in ugly, ugly, ugly little Belgium, you know. If was he the only one that was opening that tour that it suit them to show him out? Yeah, they did. I'd say, it's all, say, I'd say from the year dot. Mm-hmm. But if we talk about under the tenure of Pat McQuaid. Well... Well, and I, I agree that they they bent the rules to get Armstrong into the tour down under or the the South Austra- the Australian tour um, that he had to be uh, tested for a, per- a longer period yeah. than than before he started racing. But I, I, what, what I'm hearing in the cycling media is a lot of bluster about the UCI and about McQuaid, and I don't see any specific cases. And I'm wondering. Apart from bending the rules for Armstrong, I'm, I'm not. How, how, how big? Okay. How much more do you need than bending the rules for Armstrong? I mean, surely that. Yeah. That's one. That's one but, example. So that's the biggest example you can get. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I don't see any greater example of of uh, dishonesty than that from me. Mm-hmm. How great a bit? How 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 much more of an example of dishonesty can you get than bending the rules for Armstrong? How I mean, much more do you need? There were accusations floating around that Armstrong had uh, essentially bribed the UCI, which subsequently haven't turned out to be true. The UCI ran what policy... What do you mean they haven't turned out to be true? How well, to, to date, they haven't turned out to be true. You don't know that. The UCI has told you they're not true. That doesn't mean they're not true. How do you know they're not true? On, on balance of evidence, I suppose. What's the, the evidence? Where's the receipts? Okay. That's so... People talk about the UCI not having the resources to take on doping and cycling. So, for example, there is an argument that they kind of took a, a real politic approach, that they didn't have the resources to fight dopers, to catch them. Um, they, they essentially knew that it was going on, but they, they couldn't go around pointing the finger and accusing cyclists of, of doping. If, if they were being tested under the structures, under the UCI structures, and they were coming back negative. That there was nothing they could do. Yeah, but when there was something they could do, they didn't do it. They still didn't do it. 
you can you can say yeah, fair enough. But when mm-hmm. there was something they could do, they didn't do it. You, the EPO test, when it did become come on yeah. screen in two thousand seven one, mm-hmm. they didn't go back then and ch- and, and retest all the samples from ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Could have done that. Why didn't they do that? Why haven't they gone back to 07 and tested the content of our samples from 07 for, with, for theory? Never done that. They can do that. So what my argument to you is, yeah, sure, I, I accept that. At mm-hmm. the time they hadn't got a test for these things, they were powerless. Mm-hmm. Sure. But when they did have a test, mm-hmm. they didn't use it. And they still don't do it. Okay. Yeah. So there are some mitigating circumstances. Some of their arguments are correct. But overall, they could have done a lot more, a hell of a lot more. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Hell of a lot more. Yeah. Okay. Where they should could it? Have, they could have started by calling me in after all for the public health care policy. We read this. How can we make this better? Okay. In 99, that's how they could have started. Yeah, then they could have gone to uh, Aubrey and Delion and mm-hmm. Asson and all of the people who ever stood up ever and made any sort of statement about doping in the sport. They could have asked them in and said, okay. Tell us about this. We need mm-hmm. to address this. We want to hear from you. It's important what you're saying. Mm-hmm. That never happened. They could have gone to the same people and said, right, we're setting up these commissions now, these various commissions in the UCI, mm-hmm. and we want you on board because you've got a strong view on this. And it's important. It's an honest view. It's important we're going to put you. No. Never. Not one of them. Who do they have? they got the Oprahs. Come out of their fucking masters and all of the committees. The Oprahs. Never put any of the anti-dope people on. So. They didn't want to know. They didn't want to know. Okay. Um, question here from uh, Barry Meehan, Clamez. I don't know why I said his name, but um, where I should we give you a telephone number? Give me a number as well. I will do. I will do. <laughs> where should performance enhancement stop? So, for example, what's your view on altitude tents? We see the introduction of uh, some seriously advanced sports science in cycling. Yeah. Um, and, and not everybody has has the opportunity to avail of that. That's right. Yeah. What, what's That's your view on where it should well, stop? Where should it stop? Well, it's the view that you know that doping is a list of products, and that anything that's not on that list is doping. I don't actually subscribe to that. I think you know. Mm-hmm. I think you know when you're putting chemicals into your body uh, that you're crossing a line. Um, so I I say it stops that anything other than you know vitamins. Mm-hmm. that you're putting in. That's where it stops. I'd be a purist. Okay. I'd be against, actually, any sort of injections yeah. uh, being, being used, you know, to just get everybody saying, right, bread and water for everybody. Let's yeah. see what, and what the fucking race you have then? Jesus, you would have some fucking race. You took all that shit out of it, all these fucking doctors with their fucking fat tests, and you just said, right, let's pair it all back and just go on natural out. What a fucking race. What a sport we have there. We have the best sport in the world, bar none. We have the greatest fucking sport in it. People would be glued to it. Absolutely glued to it. Okay. Um, Paul Kimmich is sworn in as the new president of the UCI in 2013. What are the fundamental changes that Paul Kimmich would make to the sport? Okay, well, obviously, first of all, I'm going to get rid of... That means that McQuaid and Robert have gone, which is a good thing. Uh, and then the central thing, and the first thing that has to, that has to happen if mm-hmm. the sport is to have any chance. And unless mm-hmm. you remove McQuaid and McGuigan, this yeah. sport has no chance. Yeah. And I will be out of it very soon yeah. unless that happens. If they don't go, I'm out of it. I'm finished with it. Okay, so I made President right. First thing I'll do is I'm going to uh, appoint uh, supervisors for every team. Everybody's mm-hmm. going to have a doping supervisor who's going to uh, be friendly with all the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's going he's to be there as an independent observer to record who the riders are associated with, who's treating them uh, medically, uh, mm-hmm. what's going on in the hotel rooms at night. He's just going to be a supervisor. Every team is, mm-hmm. going to, is going to have one of these. Every press conference that every team gives for one year will start with a room full of media and a line full of riders at the top and the team's press officers are coming in to the, coming into the room and starting the press conference by saying, okay, gentlemen, we know you want to talk about the sporting issues, but before that, we're going to talk about the doping issues. Mm-hmm. We're going to, uh, any questions you have, anything you're not happy with in the sport or about our team, we want you to ask those questions now. Uh, and when we finish with all of the questions and any reservations you may have about our team and our sport, then we'll talk about the race. 
Okay? And what that does immediately is mm-hmm. it changes the culture. It, it, it's telling your riders this is important. It is important that you talk about this and you speak openly about it. And we're encouraging you to do this. We're encouraging you to report anything you don't like or see, anything your teammates do. We're encouraging you to do that and there is no, uh, there will be no repercussions if you do mm-hmm. that. So you're changing the culture from one where all these guys sitting up on stage here are fucking terrified even mentioned doping mm-hmm. to one where they're encouraged to do it. And you change that culture and you have a cracked. You can change the culture from mm-hmm. within you have a cracked. So supervision and accountability. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Excellent. If Paul Kimmich in his capacity as, as president were allowed to pick five people to join him. Yeah. Who would they be? Michael Ashton would be top of the list. Yeah. He he is clean riders. Yeah. Will not have a better friend ever, or a better scientist than Michael mm-hmm. Ashton. I spent a couple of days with him in London recently, mm-hmm. and he really does have the riders' interest at heart and the yeah. health. He would be absolutely number one. Yeah. Uh, it's important for me to say, look, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. I absolutely do not have all the answers. Um, and you know, being put up there as someone who does have all the answers, mm-hmm. being being you know put in a position where you 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 get that you're giving me now as yeah. as president, that I'm going to be able to solve it. No, look, mm. I'm not saying I can solve it. I am saying I can make it fucking a lot better. Yeah, a lot better. So the people I'd want on board, yes, I would want uh, Michael Ashton as number one. I want Bashar. Mm-hmm. I want all of the anti dopers really split me. Yeah. You've got this there, Lang Ripper, yeah. I'll have Greg. I'll have all those, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have Miller. I'll have Floyd. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Floyd Landis. Yeah. Lang okay. Ripper, Michael Ashton, and Greg Lamond. Douters? Yeah, I like John, yeah. Okay, John and Douters. Do you see common personal traits amongst any of the clean riders so despite the pressures of the sport managed to stay clean during the 90s and the noughties? Do I see common traits? Yeah, personality. They're all grounded, traits. kind of grounded yeah. people. Yeah. You know, I spoke to, oh, I didn't speak to Scott Mercy but I was emailing Scott Mercy uh, over the last couple of months. Um, you speak to Baston as well. That's all Mercy and I would be quite alike would have, mm-hmm. you know, recognised the bigger picture of, you know, um, the importance in their lives was, you know, mm-hmm. how they felt about themselves, you know, how they were able to square the decisions they were being asked to make at the time with their own conscience. Mm-hmm. So all people of conscience, and I don't include myself, in mm-hmm. that at all I mean I would never put myself for me Baffin is my all time favourite yeah. all time hero mm-hmm. in the sport there's nobody I admire more than him mm-hmm. because he could have doped for impunity I mean he could have there was no test for Epo at that time mm-hmm. he had uh, fantastic physical attributes mm-hmm. uh, he was surrounded by teammates who actually mocked him for not doping uh, I would never have had that strength of character never so you know, my admiration for him is, uh, yeah. So personal integrity, yeah. strength of character. Strength of character, I think, is huge, yeah. Strength of character is huge. And I suppose a belief in something bigger than cycling. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. bigger than winning. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Talk about the new approaches to doping. Um, Sky's approach, which recently they've, cut, well, I mean, Sean Yates, didn't leave because he, you know, officially leave because of, of doping. Um, I think uh, Michael Rogers moved on. But yeah, it was not because of doping. Well, Stephen Young is gone, but not because of doping. Well, that's you know, is gone, but not because of doping. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, on the one hand, I would say, look, see, the, my problem with Sky is. Uh, they were founded on principles of integrity, transparency, mm-hmm. honesty, and they just didn't deliver on any of those. Mm-hmm. You know, it was great, it was fine to deny David Miller a place in your team because you had a zero tolerance attitude to doping. 
uh, but that didn't square with any of the other signings they made. Mm-hmm. You know, so you knew pretty much immediately that it was all about being seen to do the right thing, yeah. rather than doing the right thing. Okay. Um, so you look at now, and, and they're paying a huge price. They're paying a fucking huge price mm-hmm. for what's happened this year. Uh, this should be the, the finest moment, you know, Wigan's winning the tour. It should be the greatest moment, and perhaps for some of them it is. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's been tarnished, no matter how you look at it, it's tarnished. It's tarnished because there's such a degree of scepticism out there, such a cloud hanging over. People looking mm-hmm. and saying, oh, I don't know, can you believe this? I'm not sure. You, they want to believe it. And you look at the association with Linders, mm-hmm. and you look at what's happened since he's won the tour, and you think, well, I mean, this should never have happened. And personally, I didn't care if they ever won the tour. I just wanted and want things mm-hmm. I can believe in. I just want riders I can believe in. Do you believe in, in Garmin Slipstream? Or Garmin Sharp or something like that? Do you, do you think their approach is, is better? It's better, yes. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely been better, yeah. Okay. Definitely been better. But and there, are question, there are question marks over a couple of their guys. You mm-hmm. know. There are question marks. But I look at you know, I love Dan Martin. Mm-hmm. I love the way Dan Martin was. Oh, he's great. I just think for me, he's, uh, I absolutely believe in him. Um, I believe in Miller. Mm-hmm. Oh, I watched Miller this year. I mean, mm-hmm. David Miller, and I've had a very, a very rocky relationship with David. I mean, he tried to fucking fool me. That's right. He said them four, mm-hmm. and uh, we, were, we were at each other's throat for years. Um, but David Miller did something I've never ever seen any other professional rider do, and that was mm-hmm. he won a stage of the Tour of Spain in 06 after he'd come back. And he jumped off his bike, and he's interviewed by TV, and he said, I have done this on bread and water, no syringes, nothing. And I've never heard anyone make, for me it was the greatest speech I'd ever heard, victory speech I'd ever heard, because he addressed what needed to be addressed, and he was, you know, really commendable thing to do. Um, no syringes, nothing. Mm-hmm. I thought, fuck me, yeah. I'm impressed. David, David Miller's been, been contrite, um, and I think most of the cycling public believe him mm-hmm. as, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you've described yourself as being a black and white kind of a chap um, in terms of your, your moral framework. Um, mm-hmm. Sky's approach seems to be black and white, whereas Garmin is more, more in the real world. Well, so I've, I've, I've acknowledged that you know, it's not black and white. Well, you know, I'd li- I am black and white in other ways. Mm-hmm. But I do acknowledge the shades of grey that are there. Yeah. And, you know, there's no question about that. Yeah. No question about that. Okay. You know, again, I uh, I went to London last week and sat around the table and, you know, there's stuff there that, there's stuff that needs to be done mm-hmm. that is unpalatable to me, you know. Um, you know, this whole idea of a truth and reconciliation process and amnesty and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of that that is unpalatable to me, but you know I have to accept that you know for the good of the sport, we may have to do a lot of it. You know. You recently used uh, the situation in Northern Ireland as an example yeah. of, of yeah. how old yeah. enemies can can how, of how people can compromise yeah. in order to find a common solution. Yeah, yeah. And I think that okay. that applies. Yeah, that applies to to our sport as well. Okay. To a degree. Yes. Okay. To a degree, you know, I mean, it's someone that's fucking suggested, well, then why can't he sit down and pack the crowd? Look, you know, that ain't ever going to happen. That ain't ever going to fucking happen. And I say there's a struggle, well, you know, you can even laugh, and you could say, well, but look, these people have almost destroyed the sport. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, so while there is a remedy, they're not part of the fucking remedy. They're part of the fucking problem. So we move that, then we address. The remedy comes after they're gone. Because okay. they have nothing to contribute. They have nothing to contribute at all. You know. Do you think Tyler Hamilton and Floyd Landis are truly contrite? I mean, those. If you if you look at if you look at well, Floyd particularly, are they contrite? Well, what do you mean by contrite? Are they sorry for what they did? Are they, they truly sorry for what I they? Think they did? Not a bit sorry for what they did. Okay. Not a bit sorry. You know, I think they could, they would sit here and say, look, you know, I can absolutely justify. It the decisions that I make. You may not appreciate them or understand mm. them. And I I I absolutely understand mm. the decisions they made. I'm talking about Floyd. I absolutely understand the decisions he made to dope. I absolutely can totally empathize mm. with the decisions he made to dope. Uh, 
Na sve imaju gledat, pored je ovom na stranu. You ask me to be controlled, am I sorry for it? Well, fuck. You know, it destroyed my life. I'm sorry it fucking destroyed my life. But I'm also fucking sorry, I, you know, that the choice was cheat or be cheated. You know, really sorry about that. Well, am I sorry for the decisions I made? I don't know. I don't know if he would be, I'm not sure. Why would you say then? Hamilton? The, saddest, the saddest thing I ever fucking heard. Mm. So the saddest fucking story in August bar for me was that moment when he went upstairs uh, after he lost the second the appeal mm-hmm. um, and took the Tour de France trophy out and fucking smashed him to bits. That's the saddest thing I've ever heard in sport. You know that moment there. His wife trying to scoop up. That's all he has. Well, it was really sad. It doesn't get much worse than that. No, 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 no. no. Why, why would you say uh, Hamilton and Landis have something, have something to contribute to the future of cycling, and Verbruggen and McQuay don't? Well, because they've told the truth, and Verbruggen and McQuay have lied. Okay, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. Okay, they've told the truth. Okay, they lied for a long, long time, but they've come around and they've told the truth. Mm-hmm. And Pat McQuaid and Rob Rogan have done nothing but lie to us. I mean, yeah. that Pat McQuaid can sit there with a straight face mm-hmm. and tell us he was sickened by what he read in the Asada report. Fuck off. You fucking tow rag. You must be fucking joking. You didn't know about this. You know, pick up fucking Nancy Lamb and written yeah. you know, you know, many years ago. Go and talk to him already. You were sickened. It shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. No. Yeah. Okay. Tyler Hamilton tweeted... Certainly not to McQuaid. Okay. Probably not to the man in the street at, at, at the end of the day. Yeah, but, I mean... You know. Yeah, it's... Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it was the man in the street, yeah, yeah I can absolutely understand why he would be mm-hmm. surprised by it and amazed by it. You know, my mother read uh, his book. She read the book wide, but the second book she's ever read. And she was... Captivated by it, so. Okay. Tyler Hamilton tweeted, uh, Dr. Luis Garcia del Mar has told me that cyclists are angels mm. compared to footballers. Yeah. Why then are we also focused on cycling? I mean, I, I, sorry to finish the question, I can understand why Paul Kimmage is so focused on cycling, whereas I'm not so sure about David Walsh. We think about the Fuentes list. Yeah. 200 athletes, mm. only the names of the cyclists are released. Yeah. Why are we so focused on cycling? Why does cycling get all the bad press? But it's an easy target, isn't it? Mm. It's an easy target. It's a simple mm. answer, I suppose. I totally agree. I don't think, I don't think football or tennis are any better. Mm. You think if cycling gets its house in order, that that will then spread to the other sports? Or? Well, I, well, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, as a as mm. a, as a cyclist. That's where my focus would be. That's where my focus would be on, on my yeah. sport. You know, it happens to be the sport that I love. That's, yeah. I'm not going to uh, try and ex- explain that to anybody. Mm. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't care what, what's going on, but this is my sport. Okay. And you know, I can show you interviews there I've done with Nadal, Federer, mm-hmm. Agassi, mm-hmm. where I've stuck it in a big time. They weren't always printed, but I did ask the questions. So, yeah. You know, when there's been ground to ask the question, yeah. no matter what the sport, I have asked it. So, you know. And cycling, well... I'm not going to apologise for that. Cycling, from from some people's point of view, appears to be falling apart, and has been falling apart for years. David Walsh and Paul Kimmich are becoming more popular. How does that make you feel? Cycling is falling apart. Uh, well... I don't think fall apart. I go up outside my door here and I've never seen as many people riding bikes. That has to be a great thing. I don't think, I don't think it's never been more popular. The professional mm-hmm. aspect of it is definitely, you know, need, need some help. Yeah. Need some attention. But generally the sport is, uh, has never been more popular, which is brilliant. It's great to see, you know, it's great to see, you know, guys, you know, you know, finding this great secret that we've had mm-hmm. all our lives. I think it's brilliant. Uh, you know, I mean, I would never, ever have wanted my kids to be pro cyclists, but 
I would have enjoyed amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, amateur, I think amateur sport is brilliant. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted them to be professional sportsmen full stop. Not nothing to do with peace fakers. I wouldn't want them to be professional soccer players or anything. Mm-hmm. Fucking horrible life. You know? Okay, it's great if you crack it and you make it and you make the millions, but tough life if you don't. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to go and reinvent yourself again. I was lucky I was able to do that. You know, so... Um, so, in terms of the sport falling apart, no, mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's falling apart. It has some problems. It has some serious problems. It's had some problems for a while, but look, those problems are solvable. You apply a bit of truth and honesty to those problems and, uh, you know, we can get back to... We can make it the greatest sport in the world. Good. And I think most cyclists would uh, would agree with you. It's nice to hear you talk about cycling as as a as a as a, as a well kept secret because I think yeah, well, isn't it amazing? Anyone who gets on a bike would would agree with that analysis. Yeah, I mean, I mean more people now, sure. you know, who are saying, "Jay, the cycle it's great." You know, yeah. I had a, a photographer there who works in the independent, Dave Connolly, yeah. rang me last week and says, "Listen, I think about buying these uh, think about buying these um, carbon carbon bars for my bike." I said, well, how much are they? He said, "About two hundred quid." And I said, yeah, um, well, I suppose you can get a set of, you know, alloy ones that be half that price. I said, do you love it? He said, yeah, I love it. I said, okay, buy them. You love it, buy them. This is giving you pleasure, go and buy them. It's great. And so he did, you know, so it's great. Uh, it's great to see that. And, uh, you know, I hope to, uh, yeah, I hope to do a bit more mm-hmm. in next year. Yeah, definitely. So I suppose your answer is, Paul, that maybe while pro cycling has its difficulties, then... Cycling's not falling apart. That no, grassroots it's, cycling it's definitely is not, stronger than it's, ever. It's definitely not falling apart. Look, yeah. obviously, you, you would hope there might be more, you know, kids riding bikes yeah. than you know animals. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I think it's spreading. I think uh, you know, it's. I still think the sport is pretty healthy. Yeah. Good. Okay. Just a little chart here, which was uh, was put up online with this interview, and we look back at the 2004 Olympic road race. Our most accomplished member, Kieran Power, finished 13th. Yeah. The highest placing ever by an Irish cyclist, and it's something we're very proud of. Mm. In hindsight, however, at least seven of the 12 riders who finished ahead of him mm. have served doping bans, made admissions, or had serious allegations made against them. Yeah. Accepting that serious allegations are not the same as um, making admi- an admission or being caught. Do you think that there should be more done to amend the record books? This particular record book, well, any, all of the record books, I suppose. Well, it's difficult, isn't it? And, mm. uh, you know, it'd, act, it'd be interesting on what Kieran has to say about that. You know, how he feels about it. Mm. Um, you know, does he feel cheated? Uh, I'd imagine he does. Um, but isn't it terrible? You know, isn't it a terrible indictment of the sport that you know you can pick up pretty much every every race, the result of every race for. Going back to the year that, and you're going to get mm. the same sort of thing. You're going to say, oh, him now, him now, him yeah, him yeah. So, you know, it, it skewers it. Like, doping has skewered the sport mm. for so long now uh, that it's awful. It's just a fucking tragedy, you know. Um, it's a very easy thing to do to pick out dopers. It's a very it's too easy. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is yeah. too easy, yeah. It is too easy. Um, you know, you'd have to, again, you'd have to ask Aaron how, uh, how he feels about that, you know. Uh, still a fantastic, a fantastic performance. But, you mm-hmm. know, Martin Early from, I think, sixth, maybe sixth or seventh in Chambry in, in 89, which was a fucking incredible ride. And I guarantee That's you... the World Championships, is it? Yeah. At Le Mans won, Kelly was... Yes. Third. Second yeah. or third? Third. I mean, Martin was fifth or sixth, I think, sixth, mm-hmm. seventh maybe that year. Which is incredible, right? Mm. Nobody's ever remembered it. I mean, this is a great ride. Torty is a great ride in the Olympic Road Race. Who remembers it? No. Firstly, it's only one, two, and three that people remember, and even at that, yeah. one after one. It's if you look at this list, it would have been a fifth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which, is, which is great. Look, he has he has his own satisfaction he can get from that, and yeah. ultimately, that, that's how you. That's the ultimate at the end of the day, how you feel about yourself. I suppose, really. Um, but, you know, again, that's the tragedy of the sport. There's so yeah. many races that you can, you can do that. So there's nothing really we can do about the record books? Just, no. Or then look forward? No. no. Okay. And try and you know, start again. How different would the record books have been if everybody had been clean? 
Who knows? Mm. Who knows? You hear people say that the results wouldn't have been much different. I think more so post flood. Well, I hear, I hear the guys who won saying that. Yeah. It's very convenient for them, isn't it? It's really convenient. Yeah. So that's what I hear all the time. All the guys often say, well, you know, it didn't really affect things. Well, fuck, how do you know? Yeah. So that's kind of convenient for them. That answers the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Would you think that it's a fair assumption to say that Greg LeMond won his tour clean? It's a fair assumption. Uh, well, if you ask me, uh, I would say yes, definitely, yeah. Okay. As, as much as I can gauge, yeah. I would say Greg LeMond is the greatest bike rider I ever saw. Okay. I was the greatest, not most naturally gifted bike rider I ever saw. I was in awe of him from... From the moment I first became aware of him in 82 at Goodwood mm-hmm. and then 83, I saw him winning the world in 83. I was there that day when he, when he won his first world title in 83. He was just an absolute phenomenon. He did things that were just, as an amateur, mm-hmm. blitz the Russians as an amateur. Mm-hmm. Blitz them. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's definitely the greatest boy for I ever saw. So with a little bit of knowledge of cycling and looking at the indicators, You'd say on on balance he was. Well, I answer that question. I answer that question having grilled, Mm. and I mean grilled him for eight hours. Okay. I grilled him on everything he ever did. Grilled him. So that's that's the context that that answer I've just given you. Okay. Not not everybody has had that. Not everybody has that, but that's that's that that has allowed me to give you my opinion on on him. Yeah. Okay. You know, I always regarded him as the most gifted I'd ever seen, the most talented, mm-hmm. would have been less comfortable uh, you know, saying that he did a clean. Mm-hmm. But I do believe he did. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the Change Cycling Now organisation? We've read a bit about it in the papers recently. Yeah. Well, we met in London last week. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a group of people who all want the same thing, a cleaner sport, a fairer sport, a better sport. We don't all agree on how that can be achieved. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of you know, stuff questioning the motives mm-hmm. of those involved. Jamie in particular were given uh, his position as the head of a company schemes that, are, that have paid for this mm-hmm. uh, and paid our expenses. But look, you know, I think I'm a pretty decent judge of character. And I sat in the room with Jamie and with the other members of the group for 12 hours on last Sunday. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, nobody's going to tell me that he wasn't genuine in terms of what he was trying to do. And I do absolutely believe that. And what were his totally, relations totally have been Well, that he's, you know, this is all about marketing and he's jumping on the bandwagon here. Yeah. Uh, and he's just trying to, you know, uh, get some cheap PR for his company, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know what I said at the press conference well, look isn't it fucking great that for once there's a sponsor getting behind anti-doping because for years we've mm-hmm. had so many of them jumping behind doping uh, Nike Trek Oakley all rolling in behind doping mm-hmm. it's great that we have a sponsor now That's what in, in, in getting, uh, getting behind anti-doping along with Garmin I suppose and, and yeah. the elders approach yeah. Yeah. yeah so sending that positive message out <laughs> to the general public <coughs> yes. Why not have your business do well for doing something positive and honest and true? Yeah, but I think it's more than that. Yeah. I think it's more. I think he's genuine. I think he's genuinely angry. And uh, I think he genuinely wants to uh, help move the yeah. sport on, which is, which is fair. So it's a big ask. You know, what can we do? Look, we're a pressure group. We can highlight some things. Ultimately, can we, can we make change? Probably not. Mm-hmm. But we're trying. Yeah. We're going to try, you know. Okay, and have you set a time frame on things, or...? Uh, not really. I mean, obviously now, having had the press conference and having made up a charter, we need now to try and work out what the next step is, and we haven't, mm-hmm. we're still trying to do that, in terms of, you know, where we can... Yeah. I mean, we're in discussions with the Commission now at the moment, and whether we're going to contribute to the Commission. This is the independent report, the independent mm-hmm. commission, the UPI set up. Yeah. Excuse me. So we're debating now whether we're going to uh, whether we're going to sit down with those people and talk to them or not. Because ultimately, 
See, if they do their job right, mm. if they do their job, then it's absolutely, it's a cast iron certainty what Logan and, and McCoy will be out of the sport in six months. Mm-hmm. If they actually do their job right, they'll be gone. Uh, and the sport then definitely has a chance to uh, to move on. So do you think the commission's... Uh, well, you see, the problem is, the problem with the commission is that the report goes to McQuaid, to McQuaid mm-hmm. and Verbruggen and the UCI, and they're under mm-hmm. no obligation at all to make any of it public. Okay. So in a situation where, for me, where I'm involved, well, they, they've taken the case against me, but also now I've initiated a, a legal case, uh, sorry, a criminal complaint against mm-hmm. them, well, why should I go and hand them my evidence mm-hmm. So they can have a look at it mm-hmm. before we go to court. So am I compromising myself in that way? Am I compromising my defence by showing them you know, my evidence? So well, maybe I am. So I've got to be careful, you know, personally in terms of my contribution. But ultimately, I would have no problem. At all. If I thought it was going to be public, mm-hmm. if I thought the report was going to be public, I would have no problem at all contributing. And do the other members of the Change Change Cycling Now organisation? believe in the integrity of the UCI Commission or well, the, I believe the independence I believe in the integrity of the people that have been appointed yeah uh, but they don't know anything about cycling and the question I would ask is well who set the terms of reference mm-hmm. if, if we read all these terms who, where did they get those from if they didn't come up with it themselves mm-hmm. and there's a couple of glaring omissions there so if those were addressed the terms of reference were addressed uh and all of the questions that need to be asked were mm-hmm. asked, uh, and the report was made public, then mm-hmm. uh, I'd feel a lot happier about it then, yeah. But when do you think change cycling? Now, <coughs> it's going to make a decision on that. Well, as I say, we're in discussions, Jamie's in discussions mm-hmm. with the with the commissioners, and depending on what they tell them, then they'll make the decision. Okay. I mean, obviously, the, the time is short. Yeah. So it depends on what, uh, you know, Okay. What happens there? And Paul, this is a little bit of a left field question, but I think you'll, you'll appreciate the relevance of it. Well, I hope you will. Um, pro cycling has an absence of ethnic minorities, mm-hmm. gay cyclists, etc. Um, you think about. Well, I wouldn't say an absence of gay. You're, you're well, assuming, you're openly, openly gay. Openly gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah. What do you think about this? Uh, what do I think about it? Mm. Well, I'm sure there are some gay pros out there. We don't know about it. Um, I think it'd be much easier to come out as a as a, as a pro cyclist than it would as a footballer. Mm-hmm. I don't think you'd have uh, get anything like the abuse uh, that you would, or is anything like the pressure mm-hmm. not to come out that there exists in those mm-hmm. sort of games, uh, rugby, football, soccer. I think we'd be generally much more accepting than they would be in those mm-hmm. sports. So I don't see it. Uh, as the same problem would be for those sports, but look, I don't know. I know I've heard you. I mean, Jesus, make, make, would make no difference to me at all. Yeah, no, not at all. And from the point of view of ethnic minority cycling, is dominated by yeah white European Caucasians. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Uh, when we were in West Cal, uh, we had a teammate there, Molière Jean, who came from Guadeloupe. Mm-hmm. Um. He was massive. Fuck, he was built like a brick shit house. He'd fucking toys on him. Uh, but he couldn't cut out on the road. It just wasn't built. He was a trackman, mm. really. Could have done well in the track, but mm. Jesus, he couldn't ride around around. And it was kind of for a while, you, you kind of thought, well, fucking, you know, it's the old white man can't jump syndrome. It just does in the reverse, and they, they, can't, they can't ride bikes. We can't jump or, or spin, but they can't ride bikes. I don't know. What genetic factors, if, if any, apply? But what was interesting was Molly or Jean cousin or nephew is actually now with your car and has ridden the last two tours. I think yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 he's ridden the last okay. two tours. He's the first black man to ride the tour of France, mm-hmm. I think. So it's interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. It's hopefully it's gonna change. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah. Maybe maybe sorry to bring the UCI back into this, but maybe that was one of the things that they were attempting to do with the globalisation of the sport yeah. to bring cycling to a wider audience. Yeah, sure. That it, that it is sure. Europe Central or European Central. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, does Paul Kimmich... I'll give them credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> and if we ever interview Pat McQuaid, I'll, I'll pass that message on to him. <laughs> does Paul Kimmich enjoy grassroots cycling? 
for example, watching a local cycle race or riding his bike. Yeah, I'd go out now, so there's that one around here, and there's some other races, I usually go down and have a look at them. Okay, okay. Races. Um, other than that now, would I go, would I actually travel to go and see a race? No, probably not, unless mm -hmm. it was on my doorstep, I probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely, you know, I'd ride my bike, absolutely. Yeah, I've got a bike. Uh, here, I've got one in Portugal, a little place in Portugal, mm -hmm. I ride out there, so yeah. You know, that for me is, um, and I love riding the uh, the sportives are fucking good. Great. Yeah. Because the sportives are great. I'll get great crack out of them. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. So, yeah, you know, it's brilliant riding down. You, it's, uh, I really enjoy those. Yeah. It's like being in a race, but without the tension of, yeah, of racing it's and, good fun. And, and the stress. It's good fun. Good yeah. camaraderie, good groups. Great yeah. to sit down and have a cup of tea. I mean, the, yeah. the one on Wexford is fantastic. They do a brilliant job there. Uh, so I really enjoy riding those. They're just, they're great for I think um, one of the one of the most positive things I'll take away from coming here tonight is the fact that you never lost your interest in cycling, <laughs> and, and and I and I thought that you did, and mm -hmm. it's and it's good to hear that mm -hmm. that that passion is still for just getting out on your bike and, yeah, and enjoying yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. It's one yeah. of the best things in the world. Look, you know, I've got responsibilities. I'm a father, and yeah. I'm a husband, and mm -hmm. those responsibilities have definitely impinged on mm -hmm. my. On the fact that I haven't, you know, uh, ridden my bike as much as I yeah. like, because they come first. Fair enough, fucking living comes before the joy of getting out riding my yeah. bike. So, outside of that, I would ride it as much as possible. Good. Wife, wife, wife and kids definitely come first. Finally, Paul, um, who is your sporting hero? My sporting hero. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all would be my cycling, all time cycling hero. Yeah. Uh, my sporting hero, yeah, no one really stands out. I mean, there's people I really admire. Mm. I really admire Paulie Carrington. Yeah. I really admire Gary O'Toole, swimmer. Um, I really like Paul McGinley as a human being. I've known a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, since I left cycling and became a journalist that I really like and admire. Heroes, I don't know about heroes. You know, I think we just place too much emphasis on fucking making sports and heroes. Mm -hmm. You know, what makes them heroes? Because they win, because they can ride a fucking bike faster than anybody else, because they can sprint faster than anybody else. I think fucking heroes are firemen who go into the fucking twin towers and the thing is crumbling all around them and pull bodies out. Or, you know, nurses who stay up, mm -hmm. you know. With dying people and you know, for me they're fucking heroes. Mm -hmm. I think we place too much emphasis on heroes and sports. So you know, there's a lot of sportsmen I admire, but what is never bracket them as heroes? Really, mm -hmm. I'd, you know, be reluctant to to uh, put them on a hero's pedestal. You know, and it's interesting that you chose. Didn't take from my admiration yeah. for them at mm -hmm. all. I mean, I've got great admiration. Mm -hmm. Brian, I'm, I'm working with Brian now. Brian Driscoll and his yeah. wife, he's, he's someone I. Mm -hmm. I appreciate immensely and have done for a long time. Mm -hmm. Appreciate him now in a different way than I did before I knew him. But he is there. He is absolutely, uh, yeah. Mm. He's been a colossal suddenly. Absolutely. But I think he, I don't think he'd want you to call him a hero. Definitely. In fact, I know he wouldn't. Wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be called a hero. So it kind of sounds like, uh, well, it sounds like hero worship is not in the repertoire of Paul Kimmich, but. It's interesting you mentioned batons in that integrity. It's not necessarily winning it. It's, and you mentioned nurses. I'm glad you mentioned nurses. Yeah. Firemen. Um, it's about integrity and it's about honesty yeah. and it's it's not about glory and winning. No, it is. For me, it is. Yeah. yeah. And that's not to take it any way from, you know, the sporting achievement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more all that. God, it's great. I mean, I love... It. Mm -hmm. But in terms of heroes, you know, I mean... You're asking, I don't know, I won't be fucking personal, but you look yeah. at a nurse's fucking salary and what they do for it, somebody is fucking asshole, you know, getting paid, I don't know how much money for mm. it, you know, running for 10 seconds. So it's very easy for me to identify the fucking hero on that, <laughs> <laughs> when you balance one against the other, you know. Well, I'm, it's I'm a, biased. It's, it's, I'm a, biased. it's a no-brainer. <laughs> I'd forgotten actually you were a nurse, by the way, I genuinely meant that. That's good. No, no, that's good. You know, in terms of uh, making a contribution to society. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
That's nice to hear. Um, um, and someone I haven't mentioned is Matt, yeah. Matt Hampson, who I, I worked with last year. The only new rugby player. I mean, he was fucking inspirational. Great fucking courage. Just incredible courage. So I think about Matt now is a very, very special person. And Christoph Bassans and Matt probably have a base in common. Yeah, it's kind of, they've shown courage in different ways. Mm. One is moral courage, the other is physical courage, I mm-hmm. suppose. Yeah. Okay. Paul Kimmich, thank you very much. You're more than welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. Almost, almost enjoyable. <laughs>